Hey everybody, welcome back to another uh, book study from Northeast Christian Apologetics. My name's Simon Williams, and today we're going to be doing chapter four of uh, the book On Guard. Uh, Just as a reminder, uh, this book can be uh, purchased online at, uh, let's see here, christianbooks.com. Uh, and also on Amazon. <clears throat> the The reason why I uh, put this up here is because I, I do want to, to make sure that um, um, people know how to get a hold of these books and are able to follow along if they can. But the purpose of this book study is intended to be an online resource for people who might not have the resources to get the books. So at least that they can hear the book being read and also somebody uh, who has uh, who's familiar with the material discussing it. Things along those lines. So if you're not able to get the book, that's fine. But uh, I highly encourage it. I think that it is uh, well worth uh, the money. But uh, as I said, today we're going to be talking about the Kalam Cosmological Argument. And the Kalam Cosmological Argument is uh, one of my favorite arguments. Um, it's a very simple argument. And... Uh, the uh, the argument goes, uh, as you can see on the screen, um, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And so um, this, uh, univ- uh, this uh, argument is very simple. It's easy to re- remember. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, this is the argument that I started uh, using I- immediately, as soon as I was able to um, uh, talk to people about it. The uh, um, I, I found it really uh, interesting as well because it, it, Dr. Craig, uh, he's the one that really revived this uh, argument. And uh, he revived this argument by uh, discovering that there were some interesting scientific discoveries that supported the second premise of this argument. And uh, so he goes through that in this book. Um, this chapter is going to be longer than last week's chapter. Uh, and I do intend to read the whole thing. Um, please remember that the, these videos are will stay up on um, will stay up on the uh, uh, the website or the uh, Facebook while we're uh, uh, for a while at least, and that you can revisit these uh, uh, this argument or this video and. Uh, resume from where you left off or jump in and out. Uh, I don't want this uh, stuff to be a burden to anybody. So, um, um, uh, so I uh, don't hesitate to, to leave and then come back or anything like that, but you're not going to be missing anything. But, um, so yeah, uh, I love this argument. I think it's a great argument. Um, I think it, uh, is, uh, um, uh, fantastic for, uh, starting out. Uh, and I've always been interested in, in cosmology and things. So it, it, uh, if you are that kind of person, then this is argument right up your alley. Um, I might go into a little bit uh, more detail uh, with regard to how I feel about this argument nowadays in other videos. Um, I'm, I'm working on generating... The last week we discussed the Leibnizian cosmological argument. And I'm thinking about uh, making a video on that as well, exploring uh, the first and second premise in particular. Um the things that I've discovered about the, the PSR and also um, modifications to the argument that are suitable to what the argument is actually arguing for. Now, I need to emphasize that we got to remember that on guard is an introduction and also that the intent of this, of these arguments, are to be part of a cumulative case uh, for God. So, not uh, these arguments aren't going to be able to provide you with all the properties that are associated with God, like uh, uh, omniscience, omnipotence, a triunity, um, the ability to become incarnate, that kind of stuff. Like you're not going to be able to get that from the Kalam. Um, but uh, it it argues persuasively for a particular for a particular being with a set of uh, properties that uh, God can also have. Um, and so, uh, uh, bear that in mind as we, uh, dive into chapter four of On Guard. So without further delay, if there are any other, uh, are any questions or comments or anything like that, um, I will jump into, uh, actually reading the book. 
So, um, as I uh, mentioned, this book, uh, this chapter is going to be a little bit longer. But uh, so the chapter is called "Why Did the Universe Begin?" and uh, and uh, Doctor Craig prefaces this uh, chapter with a a Bible verse, which is uh, Psalms nineteen one, which says, "The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork." So Dr. Craig says, as a boy, I not only wondered at the existence of the cosmos, I also wondered about how it began. I remember lying in bed at night trying to think of a beginningless universe. Uh, every, oh, I, and also I should mention this. Um, if you guys uh, hear anything weird with the audio, let me know. Um, and uh, I'll try to fix it. I think that I know where the audio problems are coming in, but uh, if you let me know, that will help me troubleshoot it. But anyway, Dr. Craig is saying, uh, I remember lying in bed at night uh, trying to think of a beginningless universe. Every event would be preceded by another event back and back into the past with no stopping point, or more accurately, no starting point. An infinite past with no beginning. My mind reeled at the prospect. It just seemed inconceivable to me. There must be, there must have been a beginning at some point, I thought, in order for everything to get started. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I am uh, being told that there is a uh, buzzing with the audio. Let me see if I can fix that. All right. Uh, please, it, I don't know if it's fixed yet. Uh, we'll uh, do a little test. Um, it might have come back. So bear with me for a second. I uh, don't want there to be a uh, like persistent yeah, buzzing. Uh, we'll uh, do a little test. Um, it might have come back. All right. So as far as I can tell, it seems to be fixed. Uh, so. Uh, sorry about that interruption. Um, so uh, Dr. Craig says, there must uh, have uh, been a beginning at some point, I thought, in order for everything uh, to get started. Again, little did I suspect for centuries, millennia really, men have uh, grappled with the idea of an infinite past and the question of whether there was an absolute beginning. Ancient Greek philosophers believed that matter was necessary and uncreated, therefore eternal. God may be responsible for introducing order into the cosmos, but he did not create the universe itself. The Greek view was in contrast to even more ancient Jewish thoughts about the subject. Hebrew writers held that the universe was not always exist, has not always existed, but was uh, created by God at some point in the past. As the first verse in the Hebrew Holy Scripture states, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Eventually, these two competing traditions began to interact. There arose within Western philosophy an ongoing debate that lasted for well over a thousand years about whether or not the universe had a beginning. This debate played itself out among Jews and Muslims, as well as Christians, both Catholic and Protestant. It uh, finally sputtered to uh, something of an inconclusive finale in the thought of a great uh, in the thought of the great 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. He held, ironically, that there are rationally compelling arguments for both sides, thereby exposing the bankruptcy of reason itself. So this uh, this argument is uh, um, an argument from a person named Al Kazali, and uh, let me bring him up here. So Al Ghazali was born sometime between AD 1, uh, 1055 and 1058 in Persia. By his mid 30s, he learned his learnedness had to come to the attention of the Grand Vizier of the Seljuks, uh, who appointed him to teach at a prestigious ma 
Madrasa in uh, in Baghdad. He became influential at court and a uh, confidant of the Sultan. Uh, but his study of uh, Sufi literature led him uh, to conclude that it, uh, it was impossible to live by the high ethics of his religion while enjoying the riches of powerful men because he was supporting their corrupt rule. So in uh, 1095, he left Baghdad to lead a simpler life. He taught in minor schools until 1106 when he returned to a prominent uh, madrasa to, uh, to, he said, correct theology, confusion, uh, he said to correct theolo- theological confusion among the pub- public. He died in his hometown in 1111. All right, so al Khazali's uh, argument is, uh, what is the argument that had caused such controversy? Let's allow one of its uh, greatest medieval champions to speak for himself. al Ghazali was a uh, 12th century Muslim theologian from Persia or modern-day Iran. He was concerned that Muslim philosophers of his day were being influenced by Greek by ancient Greek philosophy to deny God's creation of the universe. They held that the universe flowed necessarily out of God and therefore is beginningless. After thoroughly studying the teachings of these philosophers, Al-Ghazali wrote a withering critique of their views entitled The Incoherence of the Philosophers. In this fascinating book, he argues that the idea of a beginningless universe is absurd. The universe must have had... Uh, must have a beginning, and since nothing begins to exist without a cause, there must be a transcendent creator of the universe. Ghazali frames his argument simply, every being which begins has a cause of its beginning. Now, the, uh, the world is a being which begins, therefore it possesses a cause for its beginning. Once again, we can summarize Al-Ghazali's reasoning in three simple steps. Now, let me see if I can bring up the uh, cosmological argument here. So one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. So this argument is so marvelously simple that it's easy to memorize and share with other person uh, with another person. It's also a logically airtight argument. If the two premises are true, then the conclusion necessarily follows. So anyone who wants to deny the conclusion must regard either premise one or two as false. So the whole question is... Is it more probable that these statements are true or that they are false? Let's examine each premise in turn. So it's a, this argument is a, a Christian, Jewish, Muslim argument. All right, let me bring that up for you. So what's being said here is that uh, the Kalam cosmological ar- argument uh, uh, originated in the efforts of ancient Christian philosophers like uh, John Philoponus of Alexandria to refute Aristotle's doctrine of the e- eternity of the universe. When Islam swept over Egypt, it absorbed this tradition and developed sophisticated versions of the argument. Jews lived alongside live, lived alongside Muslims in medieval Spain, and eventually uh, uh, mediated this tradition back to the Christian West, where it was uh, championed by uh, Saint Bonaventure. Uh, since Christian, Muslims, and Jews uh, share a common belief in creation, the Kalam cosmological argument has enjoyed great intersectarian appeal and helps to build bridges for sharing one's faith with Jews and especially Muslims. So we're going to be talking about the first premise now. And as a reminder, the first premise is whatever begins to exist has a cause. So Dr. Craig says, Uh, I think that the first premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause is virtually undeniable for any seeker, sincere seeker of truth. Uh, For something to come into being without any cause whatsoever would be to come into being from nothing. That is surely impossible. Let me give three reasons to support this premise. Number one, something cannot come from nothing. To claim that something can come from nothing... Uh, that can come into being from nothing is worse than magic, as Dr. Craig very frequently likes to say. Uh, when a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat, at least you've got the magician, not to mention the hat. But if you deny premise one, you've uh, got to think that the whole universe just appeared at some point in the past for no reason whatsoever. But nobody sincerely believes that things, say a horse or an Eskimo village, can just pop into being without a cause. Uh, this isn't rocket science. In The Sound of Music, when Captain Von Trapp and uh, Maria reveal their love for each other, what does Maria say? Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. 
Uh, we don't normally think of philosophical uh, principles as romantic, but uh, Maria was here expressing a fundamental principle of classical metaphysics. And no doubt she had been well trained in philosophy at the convent school. The convent school. Sometimes skeptics will respond to this point by saying that in uh, physics, subatomic particles, so called virtual particles, come into being from nothing. Or certain theories of the origin of the universe are sometimes described in popular magazines as getting something from nothing, so that the universe is the exception of the proverb, there ain't no free lunch. So when we talk about metaphysics, um, let me bring this down. So a metaphysics is, uh, he's going to be talking about metaphysics here, and uh, which is just a branch of philosophy devoted to exploring questions uh, about the nature of uh, ultimate reality. Prominent issues in metaphysics include the nature of existence, the nature of time and space, the relation of mind and body, uh, the reality of abstract objects, and the existence of God. So this skeptical response uh, represents a, a deliberate abuse of science. As Dr. Craig continues, uh, the theories in question have to do with uh, par uh, particles originating as a fluctuation of the energy contained in the vacuum. The vacuum in modern physics is not what the laymen understand by vacuum, namely nothing. Rather, in physics, the vacuum is a sea of fluctuating energy governed by physical laws and having a physical structure. To tell laymen that n on such theories, something comes from nothing is a distortion of these theories. Um, so he uh, usually you can hear about these kinds of things and what's what he likes to call pop science. Um, so if you have a, a if uh, you have to be very very leery of uh, popular articles and uh, television shows on scientific theories, in order to communicate these highly uh, technical theories to laymen, writers in inevitably have to resort to metaphors and word pictures that can be grossly misleading and inaccurate. The claim that uh, physics shows that something can come from nothing is a case in point. Um, I actually uh, also have to uh, agree with Dr. Craig here, especially with regard to like shows and stuff, because I uh, um, used to do uh, uh, nuclear chemistry professionally and uh, often Often when nuclear power is portrayed in shows and talked about in movies, it's, uh, it makes me cringe because of how uh, distorted it often is. Um, modern times, it's a little bit better, but the further back you go, it uh, gets worse. But anyway, um, Dr. Craig continues, uh, properly understood, nothing... It does not mean just empty space. Uh, nothing is the absence of anything whatsoever, even space itself. As such, nothingness has literally no properties at all, since there isn't anything to have any properties. How silly, then, when popularizers say things like nothingness is unstable, or the universe tunneled into being out of nothing. When I first published my work on the Kalam Cosmological Argument back in 1979, I figured that atheists would attack premise 2 of the argument, that the universe began to exist. But I didn't think they'd go after premise one, for that would expose them as people not sincerely seeking after truth, but, uh, just look, uh, but just looking for an academic refutation of the argument. What a surprise, then, to hear atheists deny premise one in order to escape the argument. For example, Quentin Smith of uh, uh, Western uh, Michigan University responded that the most rational position to hold is that the universe came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. A nice close to a Gettysburg Address of atheism, perhaps. Uh, this is simply the faith of an atheist. In fact, I think this uh, represents a greater leap of faith and belief in the existence of God. For it is, I repeat, literally worse than magic. If this is the alternative to belief in God, then unbelievers can never accuse uh, believers of irrationality. For what could be more evidently irrational than this? Number two. If something can come into being from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything or everything doesn't come into being from nothing. Think about it. Why don't be uh, bicycles and Beethoven and root beer just pop into being from nothing? Why is it only universes that come into being from nothing? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? There can't be anything about nothingness that favors universes, for nothingness doesn't have any properties, nor can anything constrain nothingness, for there isn't anything to be constrained. So we're up to the first question, and uh, this question is, so uh, why do you suppose so many smart people think it makes sense that the universe may have popped into being from nothing without a cause? 
And so um, I don't actually run into too many people that think that the universe uh, popped into being uncaused out of nothing. Um, nowadays, uh, it uh, seems to be more popular to believe that uh, some non-God um, mind caused the universe to come into being or that uh our universe, our observable universe is just a, uh, um, either a child universe from some sort of a universe creating mother universe, or it's part of a cyclical kind of, uh, view of, uh, reality of the universe. So I don't really see too many people, uh, claiming that the universe came into being out of nothing, uncaused out of nothing. Um, but, uh, that's just me. Uh, if you have, let me know, uh, in the comments, uh, don't forget, uh, this, we can interact, uh, although it is, uh, you know, limited, but we can still interact through the comment section. Um, and that uh, also helps me carry on with my, uh, thoughts often, often I need, uh, some sort of prompting in order to be able to be more, uh, expressive in, uh, my view of things for some reason, but you know, this is, uh, only our fourth time doing a, a live stream like this. So, uh, bear with me as I get used to the whole setup. Um, all right. So, uh, Dr. Craig continues with saying, I've heard atheists respond to this argument by saying that premise one is true of everything in the universe, but not of the universe. But, uh, this is just the old taxi cat fallacy that we encounter in chapter three. You can't dismiss the causal principle like a cab. Once you get to the universe, Premise one is not uh, merely a law of nature, like the law of gravity, which only applies to the universe. Rather, it's a metaphysical principle that governs all being, all reality. So we're up to the second question already. So which states? Uh, what would you say to someone who says uh, that nothing... Uh, ever begins to exist uh, since uh, everything is made of prior material constituents. So I do run into this uh, where uh, people have said since uh, energy uh, can't be created or destroyed and since all matter is uh, comprised of energy, that means that nothing really begins to exist. Um, that means that that, that includes uh, myself and uh, other human beings that we didn't actually begin to exist because the matter that we're comprised of uh, pre-existed us. Um, and that, uh, to me, is uh, kind of silly because uh, even though uh, the material out of which things are made, it still is the case that Simon Williams began to exist. You know, And then we can use those kinds of... Uh, observations uh, to infer uh, other aspects of uh, reality, uh, whether uh, of material things, you know. So it doesn't need to be the case that uh, the causal principle is drawn into question just because it, we're made out of things that are pre-existing. What needs to be demonstrated is that energy actually is eternal, um, that, it, uh, that it, it, it seems to be a physical... Uh, truth, a physical law that energy can't be created or destroyed. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about that kind of stuff, we're talking about in a closed system. And so we don't really know how closed the universe is. Um, we will never understand, we'll never know, uh, we would never be able to detect, as far as I know, whether or not a being could uh, shoot in an extra electron or remove a couple electrons from this universe, you know? Um, so yeah, uh, the, uh, I, I think that we can, uh, so I don't think it's a problem if we're made out of pre-existing material. Uh, it doesn't seem to bring into question the actual causal principle itself. This isn't something that brings to question the causal principle for me, but other things can, I think. Um, so Dr. Craig continues, at this point, the atheist is likely to retort, all right, if everything has a cause, what is God's cause? 
I'm amazed at the self-congratulatory attitude of students who pose this question. They imagine that they've said something very important or profound when all they've done is misunderstand the premise. Premise 1 does not say that everything has a cause. Rather, it says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Something that is eternal wouldn't need a cause since it never came into being. Ghazali would uh, therefore respond that God is eternal and uncaused. This is not special pleading for God, since this is exactly what the atheist has traditionally said about the universe. It is eternal and uncaused. The problem is that we have good evidence that the universe is not eternal, but uh, had a beginning. And so the atheist is uh, backed into a corner of saying the universe sprang into being without a cause, which is absurd. Number three, common experience and scientific evidence confirm the truth of premise one. Premise one is constantly verified and never falsified. Um, it's hard to understand how anyone committed to modern science could deny that premise one is more plausibly true than false in light of the evidence. So I think that the first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument is clearly true. Um, if the, the price of denying the argument's uh, conclusion is uh, denying premise one, then atheism is philosophically bankrupt. So Dr. Craig makes some pretty strong uh, statements here. And uh, I know that uh, these strong statements can be uh, quite uh, frustrating for uh, non-believers. You know, so bear that in mind uh, when uh, talking to people. Um, so uh, it, it, remember to uh, talk to um, unbelievers and relay your understanding of these things with uh, gentleness and respect. Um this uh, this can come across as kind of abrasive. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention with the the scientific evidence and confirmation uh, of the truth, uh, it is uh, generally, uh, from my perspective, it is uh, this premise is constantly confirmed and never disconfirmed, and to reject this premise runs the risk of destroying science. But people will say that. Um, um, like uh, going back to the virtual particles and things of that nature, that uh, uh, that since we don't know, or if we're re re talking about the decay of radioactive uh, isotopes, um, they'll say we don't know what caused the decay of the radioactive isotopes, and therefore we uh, we have a beginning of an event that doesn't have a cause, and um, and something that I like to point out to people is. Uh, I used to do radioactive analysis all the time. And uh, the fact that radio radioactive isotopes, specific radioactive isotopes, have specific um, decay functions and also specific half-lives and also specific energy values for the gammas that are emitted or um, the betas that are emitted indicates that there are conditions uh, that are met to for the uh, radioactive decay to take place we just don't know exactly what those conditions are at this time um, so it's just a bad uh, example to provide when you're talking about like radioactive decay and things of that nature um, from my perspective uh, but uh, you will definitely see that if you are talking to people about the Kalam uh, so we're up to so this is all that Dr. Craig says about premise one um, so now he's going to move on to premise two, which he definitely believes is the more controversial uh, topic and uh, the more controversial premise. And he spends a lot more time on this one. So uh, so Dr. Craig continues, the more controversial premise uh, in the argument is premise two, that the universe began to exist. Let me present two philosophical arguments and two scientific arguments in defense of this premise. So. Uh, the first philosophical argument is boop. an actually infinite number of things cannot exist. All right, so Dr. Craig continues on and says, uh, Ghazali argued that if the universe never began to exist, then uh, uh, then there have uh, been uh, then there have been an infinite number of past events prior to today. But he argued an infinite number of things cannot exist. This claim needs to be carefully nuanced. Ghazali 
recognized that a potentially infinite number of things could exist, but he denied that an actually infinite number, infinite number of things could exist. Let me explain the difference. So potential versus actual infinity. When we say that something is potentially infinite, infinity serves merely as an ideal limit that is never reached. For example, you could divide any finite distance in half and then into fourths and then into eighths and then into sixteenths and so on to infinity. The number of divisions is potentially infinite in the sense that you could go on dividing endlessly, but you'll never arrive at an infinitieth division. You'd never have an actually infinite number of parts or divisions. Now, Ghazali had no problem with the existence of uh, merely potential inf infinities, for, their, for these are just uh, ideal limits. But when we come to an actually, actual infinite, we're dealing with a collection that is not growing toward infinity as a limit, but is already complete. The number of members already in the collection is greater than any finite number. Ghazali argued that if an actually infinite number of things could exist, then various uh, absurdities would result. If we're to avoid these absurdities, then we must deny that an actually infinite number of things exists. That means that the number of past events cannot be actually infinite. Therefore, the universe cannot be beginningless. Rather, the universe began to exist. All right, so now he's going to move on to an objection from modern math. Um, it's very frequently alleged that this uh, kind of argument has been invalidated by developments in modern mathematics. In modern set theory, the use of actually infinite sets is commonplace. For example, the set of natural numbers, that's one, zero, one, two, all to infinity, has an actually infinite number of members in it. The number of members in this set is not merely potentially infinite, according to modern set theory. Rather, the number of uh, members is actually infinite. Many people have mistakenly inferred that these developments undermine Ghazali's argument. So uh, this is a uh, when they talk about set theory and stuff like that, they're, they're referring often to uh, uh, Cantor. So George Cantor uh, developed a modern theory of uh, infinite set the uh, infinite sets. Infinity has been blamed for driving him mad, uh, but more likely it was a combination of stressors and genes that fueled what was probably bipolar disorder. Several of his fellow mathematicians opposed his ideas, but despite his bouts of deep depression, Cantor continued to press his views. He corresponded with uh, theologians and even Pope Leo VIII about infinity, and he was convinced that the transfinite numbers had come to him as a message from God. So, um, so the answer to the objection, uh, reality versus fiction, uh, these developments in modern mathematics uh, merely show that if you adopt certain axioms and rules, when you uh, can talk about actually infinite collections in a consistent way without contradicting yourself, all this accomplishes is showing how to set up a certain universe of discourse for talking consistently about actual infinities, but it does absolutely nothing to show that such mathematical entities entities really exist or that an actually infinite number of things can really exist if Ghazali is right then this universe is this universe of discourse may be regarded as just as uh, as just a, a fictional realm like the world of Sherlock Holmes or something that exists only in your mind moreover Ghazali's uh, claim is not that the existence of an actually infinite number of things involves a logical contradiction but that it real that it is really impossible um, uh, to give an analogy the claim that something came into existence from nothing isn't logically contradictory but but nevertheless it it's really impossible these modern mathematical developments, far from undermining Ghazali's argument, can actually strengthen it by providing us insight into the strange nature of actual infinities. So in order to uh, demonstrate this better, he's going to give us a little illustration called Hilbert's Hotel. The way in which uh, Ghazali brings out the real imp impossibility of an actu actually an infinite number of things is by imagining what it would be like if such a collection would exist and then drawing out the absurd consequences. Let me share one of my favorite illustrations called Hilbert's Hotel, the brainchild of, great, of the great German mathematician David Hilbert. Hilbert. Hilbert 
First, it invites us to imagine an ordinary hotel within, with a finite number of rooms. Suppose, furthermore, that all the rooms are full. All right. So, uh, if a new guest shows up at the desk at, asking for a room, the manager says, sorry, all the rooms are full. And that's the end of the story. But now, says Hilbert, let's imagine a hotel with an infinite number of rooms. And let's suppose, once again, that all the rooms are full. This fact must be clearly appreciated. There is only a single vacancy throughout the entire infinite hotel. Uh, there isn't a single vacancy throughout the entire infinite hotel. Every room already has somebody in it. Now, suppose a new guest shows up at the front desk asking for a room. No problem, says the manager. He moves the person who is staying in room one into number two. Uh, the person who is staying in two into three. The person who is staying in the three into four and so on in, uh, to infinity. As a result... These room ch as a result of these room changes, room one now becomes vacant and the new guest gratefully checks in. But before he arrived, all the rooms were already full. It gets worse. Let's now suppose Hilbert says that an infinity of new guests shows up at the front desks, uh, the front desk asking for rooms. No problem, no problem, says the manager. He moves the person who is staying in number one into room two. The person who's staying in room two into room four. The person who's staying in room three into room six. Each time moving the person into the room number twice his own. Since any number multiplied by two is an even number, all the guests wind up in even number rooms. As a result, all the odd number rooms become vacant. And the infinity of new guests is easily accommodated. In fact, the manager, manager could do this an infinite number of times and always accommodate an infinite infinitely more guests and yet before they arrived all the rooms were already full as a student once remarked to me hilbert's hotel if uh, if it could exist would have to have a sign posted outside no vacancies guests welcome but hilbert's hotel is even stranger than the great german mathematician made it out to be for just ask yourself the question what would happen if some of the guests started to check out Suppose all the guests in the odd number of rooms check out. In this case, an infinite number of people has left a hotel. Indeed, as many as remained behind. And yet, there are no fewer people in the hotel. The number is just infinite. Now, suppose a manager doesn't like having a half-empty hotel. It looks bad for business. No matter. By moving the guests as before, only this time in the reverse order, he converts his half-empty hotel into one that is bursting at the seams. Now you might think that this, uh, that these maneuvers, the manager could, that by these maneuvers, the manager could always keep his strange hotel fully occupied. But you'd be wrong. For suppose uh, the guests in rooms two, I mean four, five, six, and out to infinity check out. At a at a single stroke, the hotel would be virtually emptied. The guest register reduced to just three names, and the infinite converted to finite and yet it would be true that the same number of guests checked out this time as when all the guests in the odd numbered rooms checked out can such a hotel exist in reality hilbert's hotel is absurd since nothing hangs on the illustrations involving uh, a hotel the argument can be generalized to show that the existence of an actually infinite number of things is absurd so we are <laughs> James says uh, Hilbert's absurdity has always annoyed you. Uh, how do, uh, how does it actually annoy you? I'm not I'm not sure how it it annoys you. Um, is it annoying because it's uh, hard to understand, or is it annoying because uh, um, just the nature of infinity moving around and all that stuff? Um, because I've always found it to be a curiosity. Um, but I never really, uh, uh, did the, uh, 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 I've never really considered it to be annoying. Uh, all right. So, uh, Kevin says it's not really absurd. It's just hard to grasp for non-mathematicians. Yeah, I believe that. All right. So, um, uh, we have to emphasize here that, uh, um, that 
when we're talking about Hilbert's Hotel, we're talking about an actual physical thing, and we're not talking about just a, a logical kind of stuff. So, um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, we're going to have to deal with uh, people actually checking out and people actually leaving the place, which can run into difficulties. All right, so uh, the next question that comes up, Nothing in our universe can be actually infinite, uh, but uh, what about God, who is beyond our universe? In what sense is God infinite? Does this matter? So, generally speaking, when uh, people talk about God being infinite, they're talking about uh, infinite in a qualitative sense. They're not talking about it in an infinite sense. And at least that's what Dr. Craig says uh, when he's confronted with this question. Um Dr. Craig is uh, strongly opposed to, uh, he thinks that it's metaphysically, it's plausibly metaphysically impossible for an actually infinite number of things to actually exist. Um, I personally am not uh, as confident in that as he is, and, and I'm not entirely sure how confident Dr. Craig is in a, is on this. Um but um, uh, I can definitely see how people would find it to be absurd. Um, uh, but with regard to God, uh, we're not talking about a, a value or a, a quantifiable aspect of God. Uh, but a quali- uh, this is just a quality thing. Um, with regard to like saying God's strength is infinite, uh, it would be the same to say if there is strength or power, then God has it, essentially or that God has it to a maximum degree. All right. Um, so if, uh, if uh, nobody else has anything on this, I'm going to move on to responses to Hilbert's Hotel. Um, all right. So, uh, sometimes people react to Hilbert's Hotel by saying that these absurdities result because the concept of infinity is beyond us and we can't understand it. But this reaction is mistaken and naive. As I said, in infinite set theory is a highly developed and well understood branch of modern math- mathematics. The absurdities result because we do understand the nature of the actual in- infinite. Hilbert was a smart guy, and he knew well how to illustrate the bizarre consequences of the existence of an actually infinite number of things. Really, the only thing uh, the critic can do at this point is just bite the bull and say that a Hilbert Hilbert's hotel is not absurd. Sometimes critics will try to uh, justify this move by saying that if an actual, actual infinite could exist, then such situations are exactly what we would expect. But this justification is inadequate. Hilbert would, of course, agree that if an actual infinite could exist, the situation with his imaginary hotel is what we would ex- is what we should expect. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good illustration. But the question is whether such a hotel is really possible. All right, so we're up to the next question, uh, which says. Um, Uh, Al Ghazali shows that an infinite number of past events is impossible. What about the future? Is it uh, actually or merely potentially infinite? How is uh, eternity different from an infinite number of moments in time? So, um, so Dr. Craig hasn't really gotten to this point yet, but um, Dr. Craig is uh, he he argues for what's called an a theory version of time, and this uh, theory of time is uh talk is is where only the present actually exists and that temporal becoming is an actual feature of reality and what temporal becoming is is that the uh, the future is a potential st- is a just a potential state of affairs that becomes reality so it's called temporal becoming it becomes real while the present becomes part of the past and that there's a uh There's an ontological difference between the past, the present, and the future, where the future is non-existent but potentially existent, while the past is non-existent and also not potentially existent. And um, and that has uh, consequences to it. 
Uh, but he's not going to be able to get into it in this book. I don't, uh, I'm, if I recall correctly. Um, but, um, but a potential infinite is a, as already discussed, is different from an actual infinite. In that a potential infinite is that you're always going towards a limit that is never reachable. While an actual infinite says that it's a closed set that it has actually been completed. Um, and you're going to find a lot of people that argue for a, a different version of understanding of time, which is B theory. And the B theory is a tenseless view of time in which all temporal coordinates are equally real. Um, Dr. Craig goes into a lot of detail on this in his book called Reasonable Faith, which is like an advanced version of On Guard. But he's not going to really get into it in this book. All right. Uh, let me see if I can help the buzzing again. I'm sorry about that. All right, let me, uh, hopefully that helped. Man, I'm telling you, me and audio. I always have uh, something with audio. So hopefully that's better. Um, I apologize about that. Um, so uh, continuing on with what Dr. Craig says. Um, uh, moreover, the critics uh, can't just bite the bullet when it comes uh, to situations like uh, the guests checking out of the hotel. For here, we have a logical contradiction. We subtract identical quantities from identical quantities and come up with non-identical results. That's why subtraction of infinity from infinity is mathematically prohibited. But while we may slap the hand of the mathematician who tries to break the rules, we can't stop real people from checking out of the hotel. So I think Ghazali's argument is a good one. It shows that the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the universe must have had a beginning. All right, so we're up to about the next uh, section of the book, which is uh, the second philosophical argument. You can't pass through an infinite number of elements one at a time. So Ghazali had a second independent argument for the beginning of the universe. So those who deny that the universe began to exist have to refute not only his first argument, but but his second one as well, since it's independent of the first one. All right, so. Counting to or from infinity. Uh, the series of past events. Uh, Ghazali observes... Uh, uh, the series of past events, Ghazali observes, has been formed by adding one event after another. The series of past events is like a sequence of dominoes falling one after another until the last domino today is reached. But he argues no series that is formed by adding one member after another can be actually infinite. For you cannot pass through an infinite number of elements in time. Um... This is easy to see in, in the case of uh, trying to count to infinity. No matter how high you count, there's always an infinite number, uh, an infinity of numbers left to count. But you uh, can't count to infinity. How, uh, how could you count? But if you can't count to infinity, how could you count down from infinity? This would be like trying to count down all the negative numbers ending at zero. Uh, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero. This seems crazy. For before you could count to zero, you'd have to count negative one. And before you count negative one, you'd have to count negative two, and so on, back to infinity. Before any number could be counted, an inf infinity of numbers will have to have been counted first. You just get driven back and back into the past so that no number could ever be counted. But then the final dom a domino could never fall if an infinite number of dom dominoes had to fall first. So today could never be reached, but obviously here we are. This shows that the series of uh, past events must be finite and have a beginning. So we're up to uh, 
the next section, which is an, an objection from every past point we can reach the present. All right, some critics have responded to this uh, argument by pointing out that even in a beginningless past, every event in the past is only a finite distance from the present. Compare the uh, series of negative numbers, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0. It's beginningless. Nevertheless, any number you pick, say negative 11 or negative 1 million or whatever, is only finitely distant, uh, is only finitely distant from 0. But the finite distant distance from any uh, past event is the present. Uh, to the present is easily crossed. Just as you can count down to zero from any negative number you pick. Uh, I've, I've run into this uh, response a few times and I've always found it uh, crazy that people actually think that this is an acceptable answer. Uh, but Dr. Craig says... Uh, this objection uh, commits a logical fallacy called the fallacy of composition. Uh, this is the fallacy of confusing a property of a part with a property of the whole. For example, every part of an elephant may be light and weight, but that doesn't mean that the whole elephant is light and weight. So this is called the fallacy of composition. And uh, so each part of the elephant may not be heavy, but that doesn't mean the whole elephant isn't heavy. Uh, in the case at hand, just because every finite part of a series can be crossed or counted down does, doesn't mean the whole infinite series can be crossed or counted. The critics have committed an elementary fallacy. The question is not how any finite part of the past can be formed by adding one event after another, but how the whole beginningless past could be completed by adding one event after another. Two more absurdities. Uh, uh, Ghazali uh, uh, sought to heighten the impossibility of forming an infinite, infinite past by giving illustrations of the absurdities that would result if it could be done. For example, suppose uh, suppose that uh, uh, that for every one orbit that Saturn completes around the Sun, Jupiter completes two. The longer they orbit, the further Saturn falls behind. If they continue to orbit forever, they will approach a limit at which Saturn is infinitely far behind Jupiter. Of course, they will never actually arrive at this limit. But now turn the story, uh, turn the story around. Suppose Jupiter and Saturn have been orbiting the sun from eternity past, which will have uh, completed the, or the most or orbits. The answer is that the number of their orbits is exactly the same, infinity. Don't let someone try to slip out of this argument by saying infinity is not a number. The modern mathematician, or in modern mathematics, it is a number. The number of elements of the set uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, infinity is the, you know, they're talking, Dr. Craig here is talking about what's called like Aleph Null. And Aleph Null is a number in which is referring to infinity. And uh, the, uh, okay. So I've been told that's buzzing again. All right, so that might have helped. Sorry about the buzzing, everyone. But um, um, so uh, what, what, what Dr. Craig is talking about here is a, a, a number that's referred to as Aleph Null, whose cardinality is equal to the sum total of all uh, positive numbers or all the natural numbers. Uh, but that seems absurd, he says. Uh, for the longer the orbit, uh, the greater the disparity grows. So how does the number of orbits magically become equal by making them orbit from eternity past? Another illustration, suppose we meet someone who claims uh, to have been counting down from eternity past and is now finished. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, few. Why... Uh, why, we may ask, is he just uh, finishing his countdown today? Why didn't he uh, finish yesterday or the day before? After all, then an infinite uh, amount of time has already elapsed. So if uh, the man were counting at a rate of uh, one number per second, he's already had an infinite number of uh, seconds to finish his countdown. Uh, he should already be done. In fact, at any point in the past, he's already had an infinite time and so should already have finished. 
But then at no point is in the past uh, can we find the man finishing his countdown, which contradicts the hypothesis that he's been counting from eternity. These illustrations only strengthen Ghazali's claim that no series uh, that is formed by adding one member after another can be actually infinite. Since a series of the past events has been formed by adding one event after another, they can't be actually infinite. It could have been at a beginning, so we... It must have had a beginning, so we have a second good argument for premise two of the clown cosmological argument, and the universe began to exist. All right, guys, uh, I'm I am going uh, to uh, take a look at a couple things uh, um, w with regard to the audio and see if it can, I can make it better. All right, give me a second; I'll be right back. I did some stuff. I don't know if it's going to help. All right. I really apologize about this, everyone. Really thank you for uh, uh, bearing with me. Uh, I don't have a, a huge budget here, so I'm making do with the best I got. Anyway, um, moving on with uh, 
on guard. So we're uh, going to be moving into the scientific arguments uh, that Dr. Craig uses to uh, argue for the beginning of the universe. All right, so the first scientific argument uh, that he uses is um, um, the uh, the expansion of the universe. All right, let's see here. Expansion of the universe. Let me drop down this other one. Bop. All right, so uh, let me know if uh, you guys hear buzzing again. <laughs> uh but anyway, Dr. Craig continues, one of the most astonishing developments of modern astronom astronomy, which uh, Ghazali would never have anticipated, is that we now have strong scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes uh, science provides some of the most uh, dramatic evidence uh, for the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. The first scientific uh, confirmation of uh, the universe's beginning comes from the expansion of the universe. And he's now talking about the Big Bang. All throughout hi history, men have assumed that the universe as a whole was unchanging. Of course, uh, things in the universe were moving about and changing, but the universe itself was uh, just there, so to speak. Uh, this was also Albert Einstein's assumption when he first uh, began to apply his new theory of gravity, called the General Theory of Relativity, to the universe in 1917. But Einstein found that there was something terribly amiss. His equations described a universe that was either blowing up like a balloon or else collapsing in upon itself. Perplexed, Einstein solved the problem by fudging his equations, adding a new term to enable the universe to walk the tightrope between exploding and imploding. So the next question, we're up to the next question, and uh, this one is, uh, why do you suppose Einstein might have been uncomfortable with the idea that the universe uh, wasn't permanent and unchanging? So um, the... Uh, Einstein, uh, Einstein might not have been comfortable with this because uh, of uh, the implications of a um, non-permanent universe. Is, uh, it could be that the universe had a beginning and uh, that would require some explanation or that the universe is going to unwind or have some sort of end point, uh, which can, uh, when you're first exposed to it, have a certain unsettling implications to it. Um, and uh, and I've mentioned this in a previous live stream, live uh, live stream in which uh, there's a the last question. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really interesting. It deals with exactly this uh, unsettling nature of uh, the implications of a non permanent universe. But. Uh, Dr. Craig uh, continues, uh, during the 1920s, uh, the Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman and the uh, Belgian astronomer George uh, Lamatriere uh, decided to take Einstein's equation at face value, and as a result, they came up independently with uh, models of an expanding universe. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, through tireless observations at Mount uh, Wilson Observatory made a startling uh, discovery that uh, verified Friedman and Lamatre's uh, theory. He found that the light from distant galaxies appeared to be redder than expected. This redshift in the light was most plausibly due to the stretching of the light waves as the galaxies moved away from us. Wherever Hubble trained his uh, telescope in the night sky, he observed this same redshift in the light from the galaxies. It appeared that we are at the center of the cosmic explosion, and all the other galaxies are flying away from us at frantic speeds. Now, according to the friedman lemaitre model, we're not really at the center of the universe. Rather, we're an observer in any rather an observer in any galaxy will look out and see the other galaxies moving away from him. There is no center to the universe. Uh, this is because, according to the theory, uh, it's really space itself that is expanding. The galaxies are actually at rest in space, but they recede from one another as space itself expands. Uh, to get a picture of this difficult idea, imagine a balloon. And I'll uh, bring that up for you guys. 
imagine a balloon and uh, uh, with uh, buttons glued to its surface. The buttons are stuck to the surface of the balloon and don't move across the surface. But as you blow up the balloon, the buttons will go further and further and further apart because the balloon gets bigger and bigger. Notice that there is no center of the balloon surface. There is a center point inside the balloon, but we're focusing it just on the surface of the balloon. But as an observer on a but an observer on any button will feel as if he were at the center of the expansion because he'll look out and see the other buttons all moving away from him. Now the two-dimensional surface of the balloon serves as an illustration of our three-dimensional space. And the buttons represent the galaxies in space. The galaxies are actually at rest in space, but they recede from one another as space itself expands. Just as there is no center of the balloon surface, there is no center of the universe. As Fried, Friedman Lamatriere model, the Friedman Lamatriere model eventually came to be known as the Big Bang Theory, but the name can be misleading. Uh, thinking the expansion of the universe as a sort of explosion could mislead us into thinking that the galaxies are moving in, uh, out into a, a pre-existing empty space from a central point, but that would be a complete misunderstanding of the model. The Big Bang did not occur at some point in a pre-existing empty space. All right, so we're up to the next question. Which is, I'll drop down my balloon so you can see me. Next question is, uh, given the name Big Bang is misleading, why do you suppose it is caught on? What might be a better name for the theory? Uh, you know, I didn't really give this any thought before coming here. And I can't really think of a better name. Um, but uh, uh, I think that it caught on because uh, there's an alliteration there. It's a... Uh, it, uh, is an impressive title. It uh, somewhat ex describes what happened. So, uh, but uh, it, let me know what you guys think if you can come up with a better name. So uh, you might say, "Oh, uh, but what about the central point of the interior of the balloon?" Ah, you're forgetting that it's the surface of the balloon that is the analogy to space. The balloon's two-dimensional surface uh, happens to exist in a three-dimensional world into which it is expanding. But on the Friedman Lamatriere model, there is no higher four-dimensional world into which our three-dimensional space is expanding. So there's just nothing corresponding to the space outside or inside the balloon. So we mustn't be misled into thinking that the Big Bang is an explosion of a super dense pellet of matter into empty space. The theory is much more radical than that. All right, so the beginning of time is what we're up to now. Let me drop down the Big Bang. The beginning of time. So as you trace the expansion of the universe back in time, everything gets closer and closer together. Uh, if our balloon had no minimum size, but it could just keep shrinking and shrinking, eventually the distance between the two points and the balloon surface would shrink to zero. According to the friedman lamatriere model, that's uh, what the happens uh, to space as you go back in time. Eventually the distance between any two points in space becomes zero. You can't get any closer than that. So at that point, you've reached the boundary of space, time, space and time. Space and time can't be extended any further back than that. It's literally the beginning of space and time. To get a picture of this, we can portray our three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional surface that shrinks as you go back in time. So let me uh, bring that up for you. Bop. So eventually the distance between any two points in space becomes zero. So space-time can be represented geometrically as a cone. What's significant about this is that while a cone can extend indefinitely in one direction, it has a boundary point in the other direction. Because this direction uh, represents time and the boundary point lies in the past, the model implies that the past time is finite and had a beginning. Because space-time is uh, the arena in which all matter and energy exists, the uh, beginning of space-time is also the beginning of all matter and energy. It's the beginning of the universe. So he also gives us uh, something very interesting to uh, take a look at. And this is uh, what uh, uh, St. Augustine. So 
Why didn't God make the world sooner? In the early 5th uh, century AD, Augustine of Hippo uh, argued that God did not make the universe at a point, a point in time, but simultaneously with time. That is, he believed God had created space and time together. Modern cosmologists have come to agree that he was right about space and time. Therefore, it is meaningless to ask why the Big Bang didn't happen earlier than it did. So Dr. Craig goes on to say, uh, notice that there's simply nothing prior to the initial boundary point of space-time. Let me throw this up again for you. There's just nothing before that. Uh, let's not be misled by words, however. When I say there is nothing prior to the initial boundary, I do not mean that there is some state of affairs prior to it and that it is a state of nothingness. Uh, that would be to treat nothing as though it were something. Rather, I mean that at the point of the boundary, it is false to say that there is something prior to that boundary, to that point. The, the standard Big Bang model thus predicts an absolute beginning of the universe. In this model, if this model is correct, then we have amazing scientific confirmation of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. All right, so. But is the standard model correct? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, bangs are exciting. So, is the model correct? Or more importantly, is it correct in uh, predicting a beginning of the universe? Uh, we've already uh, seen that the uh, redshift in the light uh, from the distant galaxies provides powerful evidence for the Big Bang. In addition, the best explanation for the abundance in the universe of certain light elements, such as helium, is that they were formed in the hot, dense Big Bang. Finally, the discovery in 1965 of, the, of a cosmic background of uh, uh, microwave radiation is best explained as a vis, uh, vestige, vestige of the Big Bang. Nevertheless, the standard Big Bang model needs to be modified in various ways. The model is based, as we've seen, on Einstein's theory of relativity. But Einstein's theory breaks down when space is shrunk down to some atomic proportions. Uh, we'll need to introduce subatomic physics at that point, and no one is sure how this is to be done. Moreover, the expansion of the universe is probably not constant. As, it, as in the standard model, it's probably accelerating and may have had a brief moment of super rapid expansion in the past. But none of these adjustments need affect the fundamental predictions of the absolute beginning of the universe. Indeed, physicists have proposed scores of alternative models over the decades since Friedman and Lamatrier's La La work. And uh, those that uh, do not have an absolute beginning have been repeatedly shown to be unworkable. But uh, more positively, the only viable non-standard models are those that involve an absolute beginning to the universe. Now, that beginning may or may not involve a beginning point. But theories such as Stephen Hawking's No Boundary Proposal uh, that uh, do not have a point-like beginning still have a finite past. Uh, the universe has not existed forever according to such theories, but came into existence even if it didn't do so at a sharply defined point. So um, he goes on to quote uh, uh, Professor Wersinger, from, uh, who is a professor of physics at Auburn University, is saying, uh, at first the uh, scientific community was very reluctant to accept the idea of a birth of the universe. Did n uh, not only did the Big Bang model seem to give in to the Judeo-Christian idea of a beginning of the world, but it also seemed to have... Uh, have to call for an act of supernatural creation. It took time, observational evidence, and careful verification of predictions made by the big model to convince the scientific community, community to accept the idea of a cosmic genesis. The Big Bang is a very successful model that imposed itself on, the, on a reluctant scientific community. So Dr. Craig continues by saying, In a sense, the history of 12th century cosmology can be seen as a series of one failed attempt after another to avoid the absolute beginning predicted by the standard Big Bang model. Unfortunately, the impressions ari impression arises in the minds of laymen that the field of cosmology is... Uh, is in constant turnover with no lasting results. What the layman doesn't uh, understand is that this parade of failed theories only serves to confirm the prediction of the standard model that the universe began to exist. That prediction has now stood for over 80 years uh, throughout a period of enormous 
advances in observational astronomy and creative theoretical work in astrophysics. Indeed, something of a watershed appears to have been reached in 2003 when the three leading scientists, Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin, uh, were able to prove that any universe that has on average an expanding uh, that has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past but must have a past space-time boundary. Whatever makes uh, what makes their proof uh, so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe because we can't yet provide a physical description of the very early universe. Uh, this brief uh, moment has been a fertile ground for speculations. One scientist has compared it compared it to the regions regions on ancient maps labeled "Here there be dragons." They can be filled with all sorts of fantasies, but the Borg Guth Lincoln theorem is independent of any physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, the multiverse must have an absolute beginning. Lincoln is blunt about the implications. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With a proof now in place, cos cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. So Dr. Craig gives us a, a description of what the multiverse is. So the multiverse, uh, some cosmologists uh, speculate that our observable universe is just an expanding bubble in a much wider sea of energy, which is also expanding. Since this wider universe contains many other bubbles in addition to ours, it is often called a multiverse. The borgoth lincoln theorem uh, also, applies, uh, to the multiverses, uh, also applies to the multiverse as a whole, not just to the individual bubbles within it. Thus, even if there is a multiverse, it cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had a beginning. We'll return to the question of whether there is a multiverse in the next chapter. We can fully expect that the new theories, uh, Dr. Craig goes on to say, we can fully expect that the new theories will be proposed attempting to avoid the universe's beginning. Such proposals are to be welcomed, and we have no reason to think that they'll be any more successful than their failed predecessors. Of course, scientific results are always provisional. Nevertheless, it's pretty clear which way the evidence points. Today, the proponents of the Cos uh, Kalam cosmological argument stands comfortably within the scientific mainstream in holding that the universe began to exist. So then he goes on to talk about the uh, second uh, scientific argument, which is... Uh, the the thermal uh, the, uh, the thermal dynamics of the universe, and he's going to be talking about the second law of thermal dynamics. So, Dr. Craig says, as if this, as if this weren't enough, uh, there's actually a second scientific confirmation of the beginning of the universe. This uh, this one from the second law of ther thermodynamics. According to the second law, unless energy is being fed into a system, that system will become increasingly disorderly. For example, if you had a bottle. That was a closed vacuum, and that was a closed vacuum inside, and you injected into it some molecules of gas. The gas would spread itself evenly throughout the bottle. The chances that uh, the molecules would all huddle together in one corner of the bottle are practically nil. Uh, this is because uh, there are so many more ways in which the molecules could exist in a disorderly state than in an orderly state. So now we're going to start talking about the end of the world. Already in the 19th century, scientists realized that the uh, second law of thermodynamics implied a grim prediction of the future of the universe. And this is talk uh, like this the last question that Sasha and I listened to. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, given enough time, all the energy in the universe will spread itself out uh, evenly throughout the universe, and just as the, the gas spreads itself out evenly throughout the bottle. The universe will become a featureless soup in which no life is possible. Once the, the universe reaches a, a state, such a state, no significant cha uh, further change is possible. It is a state of equilibrium in which the temperature and pressure are the same everywhere. Scientists call this the heat death of the universe. So let's uh, explain what the second law of thermodynamics is a little bit more. 
Uh, the science of thermodynamics is rooted in the work of the German uh, physicist Rudolf Clausius, uh, who is a uh, uh, credited with uh, formulating the second law. There are three fundamental laws of thermodynamics. The first law states that the energy in a physical system can neither be created nor destor destroyed. This is known as the conservation of energy. The second law states that a, a closed system will tend towards uh, increasing disorder or entropy until it reaches equilibrium. Uh, the third law states that a, a system approaches the temperature of absolute zero. Its uh, entropy approaches a certain minimum value. So Dr. Craig goes on to say, uh, but this unwelcome prediction raised a, a further puzzle. If given enough time, the universe will inevitably stagnate in a state of heat death, then why, if it has existed forever, is it not now in a state of heat death? If in a, a finite amount of time the universe will reach equilibrium, then given an infinite past time, it should by now already be in a state of equilibrium. But it's not. We're in a state of disequilibrium, where energy is still available to be used and the universe has been orderly structure. So now we're going to be talking about hypotheses that explain this. So Boltzmann's Many Worlds Hypothesis. The 19th century German uh, physicist Lu uh, Ludwig Boltzmann uh, proposed a uh, daring solution to this problem. Boltzmann uh, suggested that uh, perhaps the universe is, in fact, in a state of overall equilibrium. Nevertheless, by chance alone, there will arise more orderly pockets of uh, disequilibrium here and there. And I think I have uh, a little graphic for you. Uh, Boltzmann refers to these uh, isolated regions of disequilibrium as worlds. Our universe just happens uh, to be one of these worlds. Eventually, in accord, uh, in accord with the second law, it will rever revert to the overall state of equilibrium. Contemporary physicists have universally rejected Boltzmann's uh, daring many worlds hypothesis as an explanation of the observed a disequilibrium of the universe. Its fatal flaw is that if our world is just a chance fluctuation from a state of overall equil equilibrium, then we ought to be observing a much smaller region of disorder. Why? Because a small fluctuation from equilibrium is vastly more probable than the huge sustained fluctuation necessary to create the universe we see, and yet a small fluctuation would be sufficient for our existence. For example, a fluctuation that formed an orderly region no bigger than our solar system would be enough for us to be alive and would be incomprehensibly more likely to occur than a fluctuation that formed the whole orderly universe we see. So Dr. Craig tells... Uh, it tells us what uh, equilibrium is. Equilibrium is a state in which all forces are in balance and there is therefore no change. In the case of uh, the universe, equilibrium would be the point at which the temperature and pressure are all are the same everywhere in the universe. No galaxies, no stars, no planets. So Dr. Craig goes on to say, in fact, Boltzmann's hypothesis, if consistently carried out, would lead to a strange sort of illusionism. Uh, in all probability, we really do inhabit a smaller region of order, and uh, the stars and the planets we observe are just illusions, mere images on the, on the heavens. Uh, for that sort of world is much more probable than a universe that has, in defiance of the second law of thermodynamics, moved away from equilibrium for billions of years to form the universe we observe. All right, so now let's uh, move on to contemporary. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, contemporary end of the world scenarios. So uh, contemporary into the world scenarios, Dr. Craig continues, the discovery, uh, let me just check something real quick. All right, uh, the discovery of the expansion of the universe in the 1920s modified the sort of heat death predicted on the basis of the second law, but it didn't alter the fundamental question. If the universe will expand forever, then it will never actually arrive at equilibrium because the volume of space is constantly growing. The matter of energy always always ha have more room to spread out. Nevertheless, the universe expands. As the universe expands, its available energy is used up, and it becomes increasingly cold, dark, diluted, and dead. It will eventually become a thin gas of subatomic particles endlessly expanding into absolute nothingness, or absolute darkness. 
Uh, by contrast, if the universe is not expanding fast enough, the expansion will slow down, uh, come to a halt, and then gravity will begin to pull everything together again in a catastrophic big crunch. Eventually, everything in the universe will coalesce into a big, into a gigantic black hole from from which the universe will never rebound. Whether this end will be in fire or ice, the fundamental question remains the same. If given sufficient time, the universe will reach such a state. Why is it not now in such a condition, if it has existed forever? As we enter the early decades of the 20th, uh, 21st century, recent discoveries have indicated that the cosmic expansion is uh, actually speeding up. Because the volume of space is increasing so rapidly, the universe actually moves farther and farther away from an equilibrium state in which uh, matter and energy are evenly distributed. But the acceleration of the universe's expansion only hastens its demise. For now, the different regions of uh, the universe become increasingly isolated from one another in space, and each marooned region becomes dark, cold, diluted, and dead. So again, why isn't our region in such a state if the universe has already existed for an infinite time. All right, so we're on to next section, talking about how the beginning of the universe and attempts to avoid it. The observation, or uh, the obvious implications of all this is that uh, the question we're asking is based on a false assumption, namely that the universe has existed for infinite time. Today, most physicists uh, would say that the matter and energy were simply put into the universe as an initial condition, and the universe has been following the path plotted by the second law ever since its beginning a finite time ago. Of course, attempts have been made to, to avoid the beginning of the universe predicted on the basis of the second law of thermodynamics, but none of them has been successful. So, the uh, one model is the oscillating universes. During the 1960s, some theorists tried to craft uh, oscillating models of the universe, according to which the universe has been expanding, contracting, re-expanding, and recontracting from eternity past. And here's a little picture for you guys. So it's just a con constant bouncing, basically. But the thermodynamic properties of such models implied the very beginning they were designed to avoid. Uh, for entropy accumulates from cycle to cycle, making each cycle larger and longer than the one before it. What this means is that if you trace the cycles back in time, uh, they get smaller and smaller until you come to a first cycle of the ori origin of the origin of the universe. In fact, astronomers have estimated on the basis of uh, current radiation levels in the universe that the universe could cannot have gone uh, through more than a hundred previous cycles. All right, so the next uh, idea is bubble universes. Pop. Let me get, drop that other one down. So, uh, more recently, other theory, uh, theorists have proposed that our universe is just a bubble in a much larger multiverse of bubble universes. Uh, the claim is that the second law applies only to the bubbles, but not... Uh, the claim is that the second law applies only to the bubbles, but not to the whole multiverse itself. Even if this claim were true, however, it, it wouldn't matter, for we have already seen that the goal... Uh, board guth flanken theorem applies to the multiverse and requires that it have an absolute beginning. So now he's going to talk about baby universes. Finally, there have been uh, con uh, conjectures uh, that maybe black holes are entrances to wormholes in space-time through which energy could travel to spawn baby universes. If the umbilical cord tying the mother universe to its baby pinches shut, then the baby universe becomes an independent universe. Perhaps this scenario could be extended into the infinite past, so that, so that we're the offspring of an infinite line of ancestors. Sorry, it won't work. The second law still applies, so that this uh, process cannot have gone on for an infinite time. Uh, not only that, but the scenario contradicts subatomic physics, which requires that the information that goes uh, down a black hole remains in our universe. This was a subject of a bet between uh, uh, John Preskill and uh, Stephen Hawking, which Hawking in uh, 2004 
finally admitted that he had lost. Offering his apologies to scientific or science fiction fans everywhere, Hawking admitted there uh, there is no baby universe branching off. So once again, the scientific evidence for thermodynamics confirms the truth of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, this evidence is especially impressive because the thermodynamics is so well understood in phys- by physicists that it is practically a, a completed field of science. Uh, this makes it highly unlikely that these findings will be reversed. So, uh, um, we are at the conclusion. So, on the basis, uh, uh, therefore, of uh, both philosophical and scientific evidence, we have good grounds for believing that uh, the universe began to exist. Since whatever begins to exist has a cause, it follows that the universe has a cause. So, is the universe self-cause? The prominent atheist philosopher Daniel Dennett agrees that the universe has a cause, but he thinks that the cause of the universe is itself. Yes, he's serious. In what he calls the ultimate bootstrapping trick, he claims that the universe created itself. Dennett's view is nonsense. Uh, Notice that he's not saying that the universe is self-caused in the sense that it has always existed. No, he's saying that the universe brought itself into being. But this is impossible for in order to create itself, the universe would have to already exist. It would have to exist before it existed. Dennett's view is uh, logically incoherent. But what about... I want to bring that up, conclusion. Uh, the, the personal creator of the universe. The cause of the universe must therefore be a transcendent cause beyond the universe. This cause must be itself uncaused, because uh, we've seen that an infinite series of causes is impossible. Uh, it is therefore the uncaused first cause. It uh, must transcend space and time, since it created space and time. Therefore, it must be immaterial and not physical. It must be unimaginably powerful, since it created all matter and energy. So now he uh, invites us to think about uh, Eastern thinking. So uh, some people dismiss this kind of logical argument as an example of Western thinking. In the East, uh, they say uh, people pursuing enlightenment can see beyond the confines of logic. Note, though, that uh, Ghazali was from Persia, modern Iran, and that uh, India today is uh, producing vast numbers of scientists and engineers who use exactly the exactly the rules of logic and and the evidence of science that we have been using. Why do you suppose uh, that so many Westerners are drawn to non-logical systems of belief like Zen Buddhism? Um, So I do uh, see that uh, there's a lot of people that are um, interested in uh, Eastern kind of styles of thinking and I don't see there to be a problem with that. Um, I think that is uh, a, uh, an unsurprising feature. Let me see here for a second. Uh, Let me know if the stream is still running. But, uh, All right, so, okay, yeah, it was uh, there was a freeze on my end. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I personally don't have any problem with Eastern thinking. Um, I think, I often think that uh, the Western way of thinking is uh, too rigid, and it runs into problems, um, especially when you start to get into really fine details. Um, I kind of see our ability to discover precise truth to be kind of like uh, when we look at uh, straight lines in a microscope and see that they're full of jags and they're uneven and things like that so they appear to be straight uh, from our perspective but when you really get close they're they're not straight at all and um and so i i think that we do need to balance western thinking with eastern thinking um but uh but yeah that's that's my perspective on it so uh, Dr. Craig continually, uh, continues, uh, 
Uh, finally, it must be a personal being. We've already uh, seen one reason for this conclusion in the previous chapter. Only a mind could fit the above description of the first cause. But let me also share a reason given by Ghazali for why the first cause must be personal. It's the only way to explain how a timeless cause can produce a temporal effect from a beginning like the universe. Here's the problem. If a cause is sufficient to produce its effect, then the cause is there, and the effect must be there too. For example, water freezes when the temperature is below zero degrees centigrade. The uh, cause of the freezing is the temperatures falling to zero degrees. If the temperature has always been below zero degrees, then any water around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water to begin to freeze just a finite time ago. Now, the cause of the universe is permanently there since it is timeless. So why isn't the universe permanently there as well? Why did the universe come into being only 13.7 billion years ago? Why isn't it a perm as permanent as its cause? Ghazali maintained that the answer to this problem must be that the cause is a personal being with free freedom of the will. His creating the universe is a free act that is independent of any prior conditions. So his act of creating can be something spontaneous and new. Thus, we're brought to not only to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to, to its personal creator. In my view, then, God existing alone without the universe is changeless and timeless. His free act of creation is simultaneous with the universe's coming into being. Therefore, God enters into time when he creates the universe. God is timeless without the universe and is in time with the universe. So Dr. Craig uh, asks, let, it gives us one last question to ponder together. And let me drop down this other one so it's actually readable. Why do you think Theologians apparently don't know the Kalam argument. Uh, why do you think pastors aren't taught these sorts of arguments in seminary? Um, so I uh, think that the apologetics has gained in popularity. So I don't run into too many pastors now that haven't already heard about this stuff. But um, I think that uh, when you go to seminary, and I've never been to seminary, but uh, it seems that the seminary is more focused on creating people with the ability to lead churches. And so it's important to have uh, the ability to know the Bible and teach the Bible and to uh, know how the church works in relationship to the government and things of that nature. Um, theology is uh, more valuable in those situations than philosophy. But I do think that many pastors get introduced to philosophy throughout their seminary. So I'm not entirely sure why Dr. Craig is asking this question. Um, so, uh, but I do, I, I do know that they don't, that oftentimes they don't pursue a view in this. And, and I have also run into pastors who think that uh, apologetics is actually unhelpful Um in in the Christian walk for a variety of different reasons, um, whether or not they think it impacts faith somehow, or whether or not they think it uh, it just uh, can be damaging to people's faith. Um. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I I think that most pastors that you come across today maybe uh, would would actually have at least heard of the Kalam cosmological argument and apologetics in general. Um. So. But uh, Dr. Craig uh, uh, goes on to say, and we're almost done here, uh, the Kalam cosmological argument thus gives uh, us uh, powerful grounds for believing in the existence of a, a beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, changeless, immaterial, enormously powerful personal creator of the universe. When I finished my doctoral dissertation of the cosmological argument at the University of Birmingham, uh, Professor Hick took it to privately to one of the physicists on campus uh, have him check the scientific information. The physicist later reported back to Hick that everything I said was correct. When Professor Hick returned the dissertation to me, he looked at me quizzically and said, why don't theologians know about this? Why indeed? Now, it might have been the case back in, like this was a long time ago when Dr. Craig did this. I think it was back in the 70s. So times have kind of changed since then. So I do think that people uh, have a bigger 
at least the people that I interact with have a, a more interest in uh, cosmology in general and uh, things of this nature. So the Kalam is a, and the Kalam is like the a very famous argument nowadays, and a lot of people talk about it. So, all right, let me uh, let me bring this down since we're not talking about the premise two anymore. But now we're going to move over to the argument maps. All right, so let us go through the argument maps and uh, let me know what you guys uh, uh, think of the Kalam cosmological argument. Like I said, I used to really love this argument. I think it was a fantastic argument. Um, I still think it's a great argument for... Um, uh, for uh, for acting as a springboard for people to investigate matters related to God and uh, the way that the universe works and how God's creation is. Um, however, unfortunately, I am personally persuaded that uh, the second uh, premise isn't something that can be proved through philosophy or science. Um, even if it were to be the case that science could prove that uh, there is no temporal coordinate that is earlier. That uh, even if science could prove that there is a temporal coordinate in which there is no earlier temporal coordinate, which I think is impossible, but let's say that science could prove that. To me, that still wouldn't prove whether or not the universe had a, it began to exist. And even if the universe is proved to be past eternal, the same problem exists. And um, uh. I also run into problems with the first premise of the argument. I, don't get me wrong. I do think that the second premise is true. I just don't think it could be proved to be true through science and philosophy, which is kind of a big deal. I think that we only really know because in order for us to really know, I think that God has to tell us. And if that's the case, then, and if the reason why you believe in the second premise is for theological reasons, then the, the argument isn't useful for proving the existence of God. Um, and, uh, and the first premise uh, for me, I, I kind of think that you, in order for you to really, and I'm probably going to create a video about this later on, but uh, the first premise, uh, I think that the best way to believe that's true is if God exists. Um, but I still think it's a fantastic argument and definitely worth the time and study to study. And I do think that you are going to run across people who uh, find it compelling. So we're going to run through it and give you uh, Dr. Craig's uh Responses to everything. Um, he is the leading proponent of this argument, after all. So the pros, uh, the first premise is whatever begins to exist has a cause. And um, so what's said to back this up is that something cannot come from nothing. And then the con is that uh, physics gives examples of things that come from nothing. And I've talked about this um, as well. Uh, but uh, the vacuum is not nothing. Remember, it's a... There is still energy in that vacuum, and that energy can interact and cause things to occur, um, events and uh, uh, objects. And then there's two other lines of evidence in support of the first premise. Um, otherwise, anything and everything could come from nothing. Um, and the other one is uh, experience confirms this truth. So, so the next part of the argument map. is talking about the second premise, and there's a lot here, but uh, the universe began to exist. And Dr. Craig used, used two philosophical arguments for this, and the first one is an actually infinite number of uh, past events cannot exist. And the, the uh, con is that uh, mathematics proves that it can. And uh, what the rebuttal to that is, is that mathematics establishes only a universe of discourse. Not that these items actually exist in reality. Now, um, there, there is a, a oh, never mind. I won't get into that. But, uh, uh, but uh, the other ideas uh, they could come back with is that uh, we don't understand infinity, but in actuality, we do understand infinity. And these uh, things that seem to be absurd are brought about because. Uh, uh, we do understand infinity. Now, remember, like Hilbert's Hotel and stuff, 
these kinds of absurdities were brought to light by mathematicians. Um, so they are really smart with mathematics and they think that it's absurd. So we need to take that into consideration and and uh, and uh, and take that seriously. So um, so a, a con would be your absurd situations are what we should expect if an actual infinity exists, and then this reply doesn't resolve the absurdities. So the absurdities exist, and yes, we agree that they're there, but that's why we wouldn't expect an infinite number of things to exist in reality. So the second uh, way that we uh, su that Dr. Craig supports uh, the second premise is that a series for form, uh, formed by successive uh, a series formed successively cannot be actually infinite. Um, so any uh, and the con is from any past point we can reach the present, and uh, this commits the fallacy of composition. So remember, uh, the fallacy of composition is like a is similar to like any any part of an elephant is light and weight, therefore the whole elephant is light and weight, and that doesn't make sense. But you have to use this fallacy of composition correctly. There are situations in which each part, if each part has the same property, then the whole have the same property. For example, like if each brick in a wall is red, then the whole wall is going to be red. So you got to make sure that you use this for the correct properties. Um, and you can support this uh, second uh, argument uh, that if it could, absurdities would result. And we talk about increasing disparities uh, would vanish. And this is talking about like Saturn and Jupiter or uh, one would have finished already. OK, so this is talking like coming down from infinity. If you, the why, why did it end now? Doesn't make sense. So. Moving on to the uh, scientific arguments, uh, the expansion of the universe in indicates that if you go backwards in time, that there is a p smaller point. So if you keep going backwards in time, if you're if you're here and it keeps expanding outward, if you go forward, then if you go backwards and shrinking down to a point. <laughs> so that implies a beginning of the universe. And then uh, the con is that non-standard models of the of the origin of the universe exist, but Viable non standard models also predict a beginning. So, uh, so what we're left here is that the only working models are the ones, uh, as of the writing of On Guard, which this was written, published in 2010. So bear that in mind. So this was 13 years ago. Um, so the vi uh, viable non standard models uh, predict a beginning. But as far as I know, like the Big Bang is still the standard model. Um, uh, but I've definitely run into people that hate the Big Bang. Uh, atheists, there are atheists out there that despise it. Um, but anyway, uh, the the second scientific uh, evidence presented in On Guard was the, the second law of thermodynamics, which uh, says that uh, a system, the energy in the system will go towards increasing disorder. So... Uh, the con is uh, models aimed at avoiding uh, the beginning of the, the existence, and these and the the rebuttal is that these models fail to avoid a beginning. And we uh, brought up the graphics for you guys and described the, why each of the models failed to avoid a beginning. So, the uh, the conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause. Uh, this follows from two one and two. And some people will say that the universe caused itself, uh, but then the universe would have to exist before it came into existence, which is absurd. And so the conclusion is that uh, uh, this cause is an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, powerful, personal creator. And uh, these are properties um, in which uh, the uh, classical theism, um, uh, the Christian God of the Bible, expresses. So... He is a viable candidate for this uh, this uncaused being, uh, this uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, powerful creator. Now, remember, the Kalam cosmological argument is part of a cumulative case. Um, when I, I first uh, was introduced to this argument, I thought it was amazing, um, and it definitely strengthened my faith in God, and it can help... Uh, uh, People become open to 
uh, Christianity and uh, help them to understand it that maybe it's an intellectually viable option for them. Um, and so uh, I have definitely run into a lot of people that uh, also uh, really like the Kalam. Um, and so I highly recommend uh, looking into this uh, deeply and uh, then running in and trying to defend it. Uh, remember that uh, um, these philosophical arguments can be very difficult and become very, you can get into the weeds very easily with these arguments. So um, if you ever have any questions, let me know. Um, I like to talk about this stuff all the time. Don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. But uh, that is uh, the end of the Kalam cosmological argument uh, chapter. Um, and I hope that uh, you guys uh, enjoyed it. Oh, by the way, um, I forgot. Uh, let us celebrate together. You know, I didn't do this last time. But uh, yeah! Yeah, we did it together. We got to the end. Thank you so much for being with me, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, God bless you and have a great night.